In this video, we're going to cover pharmacokinetics. We're going to break down what it is and the various components of ADME. Let's get started. Pharmacokinetics is the study of how your body processes a drug. It's what the body does to a drug or the movement of drugs into, through, and out of the body. So first, a drug requires a method of administration, often known as a route of administration. Then it must be absorbed into the circulation and distributed to various tissues of the body where it's metabolized or broken down and finally eliminated from the body. And we can break down this whole process into four main components, absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. The acronym is ADME. So now let's subtract complexity and go through absorption. When a drug is absorbed, it must enter the body by some route, whether that be orally, intravenously, when it's injected directly into the bloodstream, or intramuscularly, when it's injected into a muscle. Other routes include inhalation, which is rapidly absorbed, transdermally, this is on the skin, like a patch containing the drug, Sublingually, this means placing a drug under the tongue, which is absorbed quite rapidly. And there are also drugs that are administered via the eye, ear, and nose. And most of these drugs are delivered locally and are not absorbed systemically into the greater body. Now, absorption varies greatly among different patient types. So for example, when we have food in the stomach, the stomach acidity and blood flow to the GI tract can affect drug absorption. And before a drug reaches the circulation, it will need to cross one or more cell membranes. This doesn't include intravenous administration because it's injected directly into the bloodstream. Now, movement across the cell membrane can occur via passive transport, which requires no energy, or active transport, which requires energy in the form of ATP. And there's also endocytosis. Let's go through these mechanisms. There are two types of passive transport passive diffusion and facilitated diffusion. In both types, drugs move from an area of high concentration to low concentration. Passive diffusion helps small lipid soluble and non-polar molecules. They will easily pass through a membrane down their concentration gradient without any help, whereas water soluble molecules will pass through a channel or pore. Now, in facilitated diffusion, larger water-soluble and polar molecules require the help of a channel or transporter. Okay, moving on to active transport, there are also some drugs that require active transport because the drug is transported against its concentration gradient. So energy is required, ATP is required. Specific carrier proteins use ATP to move the drug into the cell. And sometimes there are molecules that are so large that the process of endocytosis is needed. The drug is engulfed by the plasma membrane, okay? That's transport. Now earlier, we mentioned how absorption varies among different patient types. There are also drug-related factors that influence the rate of absorption, such as molecular weight, solubility, and formulation, as well as the pH of the environment, surface area, and blood flow to the absorption site. Again, small, non-ionized, and lipid-soluble drugs can easily pass through the plasma membrane, whereas water-soluble and polar drugs can't easily pass through the membrane. So the rate and extent of absorption, or how quickly this process occurs, and how much of the drug reaches the bloodstream are determined by a number of factors. And this leads us to the concept of bioavailability. Bioavailability is the fraction of an administered dose of a drug that is unchanged when it enters the systemic circulation. It's the percentage of a drug's dose that remains unchanged when it enters the systemic circulation. Let's break this down. So for example, let's say we ingested 100 milligrams of a drug and 100 milligrams of that was available to the body. So 100 milligrams was absorbed into the circulation, which means it would have a bioavailability of 100%, okay? If let's say 
only 70 milligrams of that drug were absorbed unchanged, the bioavailability would be 70%. Intravenous drug administration always has 100% bioavailability because it goes directly into the bloodstream, whereas oral medications have less. This is because it gets metabolized in the gut and in the liver. This process is known as the first pass effect which refers to the mechanism by which most drugs are converted into their inactive metabolites prior to entering the bloodstream, okay? So this reduces bioavailability because they undergo first-pass metabolism, reducing their concentration in the bloodstream. That's why intravenous or intramuscular have high bioavailability because they bypass the first-pass effect, all right? Let's show this in a graph to show the relationship between time and the plasma concentration of the medication. So a drug given intravenously will start at a concentration of 100%. And with pure drugs, it must be absorbed first and some of it will also get eliminated before it eventually reaches the systemic circulation, okay? Now, we can determine the area under these curves, AUC for short to help us estimate the bioavailability of a drug. To estimate the bioavailability of an oral drug, we can divide the AUC of the oral form by the AUC of the IV form, and both AUCs would need to be corrected by the dose of medication administered orally and intravenously. Okay, now after a drug gets absorbed, it gets distributed to various tissues around the body, such as muscle and fat. And there are several factors that influence drug distribution. Let's go through this. A few factors include membrane permeability. A drug must cross the membranes that separate the organ from the site of administration. Lipophilicity, so lipophilic drugs will easily cross membranes and therefore these molecules are more likely to leave the bloodstream, whereas hydrophilic molecules are less likely to cross membranes and more likely to remain in the bloodstream. And then there's molecular size. Another factor is plasma protein binding. Plasma proteins such as albumin will slow down the distribution process because it will reduce the amount of drugs that are not protein bound in the blood. So the amount of drugs that can enter various tissues decreases. And this leads us to volume of distribution, which relates the amount of drug in the body to the concentration of drug in the blood or plasma. This is the theoretical amount of the drug compared to its plasma concentration. In other words, where in the body is the drug accumulating? Is it in the blood or in the tissue? Okay, so drugs with high volumes of distribution are highly distributed into tissues. Molecules that are smaller and lipophilic will also be highly distributed into tissues and will achieve a larger volume of distribution. And drugs with low volumes of distribution are highly bound to plasma proteins, so there's less distribution to other tissues. This is useful in estimating the dose required, all right? Now let's move on to metabolism. This is the phase where a drug is converted into a less or more active form known as metabolites. Once it has been converted to an inactive metabolite, it can then be excreted. Metabolic reactions can convert an active drug into less active or inactive forms, or an inactive or less active drug known as a prodrug into a more active form, okay? And we can divide drug metabolism into two main phases, phase one and phase two. Take note though that there are some medications where phase two may occur before phase one, or only phase one may occur, or only phase two may occur, all right? But drug metabolism occurs primarily in the liver. Let's go through phase one. In phase one, drugs are oxidized or reduced to a more polar form. This is where the enzymes called cytochrome P450 come in. What these enzymes do is convert non-polar lipid-soluble drugs into more polar and water-soluble metabolites through oxidation, hydrolysis, or reduction. 
Now, I want to mention that cytochrome P450 can be induced or inhibited. That is, its activity can be increased or decreased by several drugs or chemicals. Moving on to phase two, drugs or metabolites are conjugated or joined with another compound by the addition of a polar group. So this includes methylation, acetylation, sulfation, and glucuronidation. The aim here is to produce polar and water-soluble metabolites, so they are easily eliminated by the kidneys. And this leads us to the last phase, which is elimination, which is the removal of a medication from the body. Elimination involves both the metabolism and excretion of the drug. Most drugs are excreted in the urine. Other processes occur in the liver, the lungs, and other organs. So excretion can also take place through the bile and feces. This brings in clearance, which is the rate at which a drug is eliminated from the blood. We can calculate clearance values for different systems. Total body clearance is the sum of individual clearance processes, such as kidney, liver, and other. Other include the lungs or muscle. Okay, now let's move on to half-life, which is the time it takes for the plasma concentration of a drug in the body to be reduced by one half. Half-life and volume of distribution help with figuring out how long a drug's effects last and how frequently it needs to be administered, and also how much time to reach steady state. Let's break this down. There are two different types of elimination. There's zero-order kinetics and first-order kinetics. In zero-order kinetics, the rate of elimination is constant. The drugs that are eliminated by zero-order kinetics are independent of drug concentration in the body. If we were to graph this, it would produce a straight line. Okay? An example of a drug that is eliminated by zero-order kinetics is aspirin. Now, in first-order kinetics, the amount of drug eliminated over time is directly proportional to the drug concentration in the body. The amount eliminated for each time period would be different, but the fraction would be constant. Most drugs are eliminated by first-order kinetics. And if we were to graph this, the curve would look like this, exponential. Let's expand on this. Each dot on the curve represents a half-life, okay? At time zero, we have a concentration of 100 of the drug. Then after one half-life, we have a concentration of 50 because it's reduced by 50%. And after two half-lives, we have a concentration of 25. By this point, we've already reduced the original amount by a total of 75%. And then after three half-lives, we have a concentration of 12.5. So once we get to about five half-lives, 97% of the drug has been eliminated from the body. So a half-life is how long it takes for half of the drug to be eliminated from the body. And we can produce this information to predict steady state concentration, which we'll be focusing on first order kinetics here. So it takes about four to five half-lives to reach steady state concentration, which is where the concentration doesn't change or the rate of administration equals the rate of elimination. So the amount we dose will be eliminated after each dosing interval if we continue to dose at the same frequency. As a result, medication levels in the body remain steady. Now, why is this important? Why is reaching a steady state important? That's because we want a drug concentration that is high enough to be effective, but not harmful. Therefore, if a drug has a short half-life, the more rapidly the steady state is reached. But what happens then if you have a drug with a long half-life and someone who needs to achieve therapeutic effect fast? How can you get that effect without having to wait? Because it still takes the same amount of time to achieve a steady state, which is four to five half-lives. So a loading dose, a higher amount of medication is administered on treatment initiation to reach the desired concentration more quickly. It will still take four to five half-lives to reach steady state, but the initial concentration will be closer to the eventual steady state concentration. Thank you for watching this video. Make sure you subscribe to EKG Science so you don't miss a single lecture. And remember, subtract complexity and slow down. To study the next lecture, simply click the next video or you can view the entire playlist. Hey, stop procrastinating!